Yeah, we're back. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, Think Tech Hawaii. And we're talking about energy in America with uh, Lou Pugliarisi, who was the CEO of EPRINC in Washington, an energy think tank. And we talk every uh, couple of weeks about what's happening in energy and the country and the world because it's all interconnected. I have found that. So, Lou, today let's talk about uh, American resilience. Let's talk about the ability of the country to come back um, after and in spite of and in the midst of a pandemic. Well, I think, you know, what we do is look at some of the recent data. As you know, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, issued its recent employment data, um, there was some criticism that Trump had fooled with the BL, with the BLS data. Uh, if anyone knows anything about Washington, it's impossible. I mean, the president wouldn't even know who to call. Okay, so the BLS. It was, data. it was way off though. It was a huge percentage off. No, no, I think what happened is there was about three percentage points off, but this was the same error that occurred the month before. And it has to do with the category called other you know, for, and we'll go through that a little bit here, but that's not the real story. The real story was when the data came out, it was much better than expectations. It wasn't that it was good, it was bad. It was really bad. It wasn't as bad as the market and everyone expected it to be. So let's take a look at the first picture and talk about that for a second, I think. So the first picture shows the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures of unemployment between May, uh, you know, in the between May 2018 and May 2020, right? Mm -hmm. And what you see here is, of course, this huge spike up to, I mean, here on chart one, which is the unemployment rate seasonally adjusted, and then the non, what we call the non payroll employment month over month change. Everyone, if you look at the table on the right, the, uh, the month over month change, I think CNN and uh, all the networks said, it's really going to be bad. And when it was not bad, in fact, it was a slight uptick. The stock market went berserk. I mean, we're virtually back to where we were. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that and may, and it may be kind of built on air, that's another issue. But I think that the fact that the unemployment rate is actually getting better when everyone expected to get worse was a very big deal. And it just shows a little bit about the resilience. But the sectors within that, and we're gonna get into it a little bit because Hawaii is kind of a picture of one sector that's still hurting quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next uh, page, the next page, which is a little more interesting. And this one is, uh, so what, what, one interesting issue about unemployment is there are a lot of numbers out there. And you'll hear that people on CNBC or uh, talk about U3, U4, U5, U6. The number that's reported in the press, the one we all talk about is the U3. And so that's why if you look at- What does at, that stand for? What does that stand for? So that is the total unemployed as a percent of the civilian labor force, right? Okay. Of those actively uh, looking and seeking work, right? Also, we have something called U6, if you look at the last one down, and that's the total unemployed plus all persons marginally attached to the labor force. So it includes part-time people, uh, you know, everybody who, who is doing something in the workplace. And if you see from the data here, the unemployment rate was, uh, fell from 14.7 to 13.3 and fell from 22.8 to 22.1. The debate over the BLS is that all those numbers should have been three points higher, but that's not as important as the fact that it came down. Okay, but I mean, you know, we don't know if it's work. Or I mean, you know, the, the problem I have, and, and, and you can sort of deal with this because it seems, um, you know, part of the whole conversation is that we're, we're, just, we're just beginning. It's like Fauci says, uh, this is just starting. Um, so, you know, we, we, um, we had this like cold shock going on 
um, when, uh, you know, it first happened and everybody decided, everybody in the country, every government decided to close down. So all economic activity stopped and all these jobs went away. And, and, and of course, there's a tail on that. It keeps going away for a while as these right. businesses find and it you can't know, function. My, my but, views then, on but then we have now, we have a rise again. And 21 states this morning are having a rise. And then we're faced with this awful prospect of another shutdown. And the other shutdown is going to have I don't think we're a, going to get another shutdown. We are not going to get another shutdown. We are I'd like to, to hear adjust. your I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. We're going to adjust and learn to live with this, and we're going to policymakers are now going to have to get off their rear ends, make some hard decisions, and put people back to work. So that's my view on this. Okay, so it's well known. So okay, we, okay. we, we, we need to, we need to talk about it because I you know I want to I want to accept that, but I need to know it, your, because, your data and your analysis because the disease is a lot worse. The, I mean, the cure is a lot worse than the disease. There is no doubt in my mind. We have enough data now to know that the kids can go back to school. They're probably not even spreading the coronavirus, that this is largely a disease that harms old people with serious comorbidities. I am not saying it's not bad. It's bad. But the devastation we are doing to people's lives and I'm gonna get into this in a second because right now we're pumping a lot of money. Not everyone is getting money from the government, but a lot of people are getting money. So the pain is not as bad as it might be, but it's bad. Or, so or as it will be, the Republicans have said they're will. not gonna fund another, another tranche of this. We don't have the money. I'm gonna show you something on that. There is no money. Maybe we could just run the printing presses. That'll be kind of interesting experiment, but we have no money. I'm gonna show you what the deficit looks like, even with without doing anything else except we're staying where we are now. So let's go to the next page, right? And I think this is, uh, this is, I could not get the most recent data for the Hawaiian Islands. I'm pretty sure this must be on the TV every day in Hawaii. I, I don't know, but um, statewide, the, the uh, change from the same month last year is 20%, right? So we now have statewide 120,000 people who have lost their jobs in Hawaii. Right? And think about this, the unemployment rate over the last 12 months in, Hawaii, in the Hawaiian Islands was between 2.4 and 2.7%. The unemployment now rate is now in excess of 20%. Is there anybody in the government of Hawaii who thinks that's a sustainable strategy? Is there no, anybody? It's not sustainable. And it's it is a remark, you know, it's like, you know, it's the, the, the percentage, the leverage, the change, the Delta factor is so big that, you know, it's astounding. You, when these, when instead of trying to adjust to this disease, just shutting everything down, in my view, has been a huge, huge policy mistake. We are not getting the benefits out of it. Now you look at Hawaii, Hawaii's got an interesting problem. Nobody has the coronavirus in Hawaii. And your main principle of employment- We have 600, 600 and some odd cases. It's nothing. That's probably the amount of people that broke their leg last month. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> well, you know, you know the, 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 problem, the problem I see is that um, in the end, um, you know, an, what is an economy? There's a million, million, billion parts to an economy. It, it's like the sum total of all human effort in a given jurisdiction or in a given sector or industry. And, and if Humpty falls apart for some reason, any reason, and you want to put Humpty back together again, you have a problem in figuring out where to start. What do you do to start the engine? Well, I mean, you have to count on entrepreneurs and traditional capitalist uh, allocative uh, you know, processes to get people back to work. People are resourceful. They're going to figure out what to do. They're going to figure out how to open their restaurant and protect their patrons. They're going to do a lot of different things. But if the government is telling them they can't do anything, they just have to sit tight. Well, 
that's when you really have problems. The I'm government not. isn't saying that now. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect the government is going to have to tone this a lot better. The government's going to have to be more refined, more detailed, more helpful than it has exactly. been. Exactly. I think that this is very popular if you can get money from the government. But let's go to the next table and you can see why this is not a sustainable strategy. Okay. This shows the 2020 budget deficit is now currently projected for 2020 for the calendar year, right? Is going to reach $4.2 trillion, right? And you can see that red line there. That is the legislative and economic effect, right? That is money the government has gone out and borrowed, right? They borrowed through the through the Fed window, printing, whatever. And you can see here that if you go back to the historic co Congressional Budget Office baseline estimate, we probably would have come in about 990 or a trillion. We're gonna come in at $4.27 trillion. Well, is that, does that include the, the money that's been printed? Um, you know, uh, well, recently, on the we, account, really accounting didn't. system, even if you print it, <laughs> I mean, basically that counts the money. It actually, the that is just the budget deficit on the accounts of the federal government. To the extent there's off accounting money from the Fed through actions in the bond market, you're right, that's not included. That's not included. That it's not on their balance sheet. That's not part of the budget deficit. Well, I may be simplistic about this, and, and you and I have discussed it before in the context, for example, of World War II, where you can't you can't fool around. You have to have the money to prosecute the war, um, and you don't you don't look at the budget. You just you find the money, you print the money, you make the money, whatever you have to do. Um, but this is somehow different um, because we're we're not in a war, and it's hard to get your hand on exactly what's happening. Um, and for a while, the government took the position that, well, we don't care where we're going to get it, we're going to spend it. And, uh, you know, a few trillion here and there, uh, we'll, we'll work it out later. We'll yeah, work it so out I, later. I, I and I say to myself, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned about this, but you got to pay it back. Don't you have to yeah. pay it back? So I will we'll go to let's go to the next picture, because that, that talks about that very issue. Right? So we can see here that the uh, pandemic is going to push the national debt past the previous World War II peak. So you can see we, by 1946, we had 106% of debt compared. Our debt exceeded our total gross domestic product by 6%. Now, the interesting thing about that, we entered an era where we were one of the sole, one of the sole manufacturing, economic, largely untouched economic machines in the world. And we were able to produce so much wealth over the next 30 years that the deficit as a percentage, the deficit in absolute numbers might have continued to rise, but as a percent of our gross domestic product, right, it began to fall dramatically. But our ability now to grow our way out of this deficit by getting our economy to grow faster than our debt is very problematic in my view. Yeah, so why would you call it resilience? I don't, I don't see resilience. Well, I, see, I, think I see a lack of entrepreneurs. I see a lack of available capital. Well, I see I, a, la a lack of um, you know, uh, entrepreneurial uh, tech development as well. Um, the entrepreneurial problem is largely because the government is keeping people from going to work. We're go so I'm going to we're going to go and see what's happening. But as we've begun to ease up, you can see we can look at uh, for let's look at two things. First, what is the mark? What does the stock market believe? And you can argue whether that's a good thing. So let's look at the next chart for a second. Here you can see the year-to-day performance of major U.S. stock indices as of May 28th. It's actually done better since May 28th. Uh, I don't have the very latest data, but you can see. The NASDAQ, which is high tech, is actually above, right, uh, where it was at the beginning of the year. 
uh, not as high as it was, but above the beginning of the year. And the S&P and the Dow Jones are still lagging, but they've come a long way back. Now, is this real? Well, part of this reflects growing optimism of the high tech center, Zoom, and all this other stuff that the, you know, the high tech community is doing well, some adjustments. But we still have terrible lagging indicators of tourism and manufacturing, certain manufacturing. We have a whole bunch of problems on supply chains. So the question of the market is, is this a sort of dead cat bounce or a sense that uh, everyone is uh, too optimistic and we're going to still end up in another major uh, decline in the market where we're going to have to work our way at it very slowly over a long period of time. But well, let's, right let's now, stay with the market. For are very optimistic. I will Let, tell let's you. stay with the market for a minute because I said it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Fascinating that, you know, we have all these troubles and we have troubles on the, you know, they say the market is always going to, you know, build in uh, its optimism for the future. Um, and, and it's pessimism. It builds in both. And, okay. And uh, what we have here is uh, a market that seems to be going up. What did I see that NASDAQ was at some kind of all-time high? Uh, you yes, know, this as case you is said, old. today it's up, it's up, it's an all-time high. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, 10,000 or something. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, quite remarkable. I mean, you would never ever expect it in the dire circumstances that it would be so high. And the, and the uh, explanation for that in the paper where I saw it was that there's a lot of good technology going on and and that's still, as you said, it's very robust. Also, there may be a disconnect from the, there's a heavy overweighting in certain technology stocks that are worth a ton of money, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. And that is not necessarily fully connected to the real economy in terms of employment, right? It's, and so, yeah, the stock market might be doing better because it's heavily weighted towards these, uh, these high-tech firms that are a bigger, bigger part of the market, but it doesn't necessarily reflect a broad base of recovery across, the, across Main Street, right, where the people work for a living. Yeah, so and if you compare it to 1929, where the market crashed and stocks went all down, um, it was not immediate from there to the depression, took a couple of years. Um, and in the process, a lot of these companies found they could not, they could not function uh, and they failed and everybody was out of work. Um, I don't know if we're there yet, but I think we're heading in that direction. Well, we it might yet to play out. We don't really. Uh, but I agree with you. If we. If we can't get the labor force uh, out into the world going back to work, if we can't find a way to deal with this, uh, we we have. We, I think there will be serious problems. But let's let's take a look at what's happening in the energy sector now in the last picture, I think, because I think that tells us a little more balanced picture. So, so this shows you um, two kinds of uh, data. The red line shows you what happened in these major categories. And one is total products, that's gasoline, distillate, diesel fuel, gasoline, jet fuel. And then the other ones are gasoline, jet fuel, and distillate. And you can see here that, for example, for uh, if you go to the top right, gasoline, gasoline now is about, uh, you know, uh, 6 million barrels a day, but it's still 20% 20, 20 below what it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. But it's not 50% below what it was a year ago. Okay, It's not great news, but it's not the bad news that we thought was going to still be with us. Uh, if you look at jet fuel, jet fuel is now down 60% of what it was a year ago, but it's not down 80%. Okay, And even distillate, this is now down about 25% and uh, what it was a year ago. But, you know, it's, uh, it held up generally through this whole thing. So the energy sector in the US, which is a reflection of what's happening in the economy, is starting to come back. The real question is, can we build on this? Can people have enough confidence 
and to uh, I totally agree Lou you know it's like there's two things working one is operating on the assumption that uh, the coronavirus will sort of hold and and people will be free the government will be free to tr to try to take affirmative steps and bring the economy back um, you know and 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 work that work that baby um, the other is um, if 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 the coronavirus gets worse and um, remember the economy is always based on public confidence and people don't have public confidence uh, and they go into the cellar somewhere uh, then you know uh, that the numbers that we have today are they're they're paper thin uh, because then they will change dramatically if we go into a second uh, well, a I second think, shutdown is what I well, want to I say. But I think part of this is uh, the what I call the, you know, the fallacy of the static analysis. We know <laughs> a lot more. So basically, there's kinds of two people in the world. If you're a communist or a socialist, you're pessimistic. The world's coming to an end, and there's nothing I can do about it, and everything's just going to. I'm, we're all going to die, right? And if you're a capitalist. You don't see the world that way. You say, well, you know, we'll figure this out. We'll adapt. We're smart. We're, we're, uh, we're entrepreneurial. We got a lot of bright people in this country. We'll adjust to it. And in fact, if you read carefully all the medical, all the medical kinds of advancements taking place, even without a vaccine, our ability to treat this disease is getting better and better. Performance levels are rising dramatically. We have a much better sense of who's vulnerable and who's not. And so my, my position on this is when you look at the devastation of the economy and you look at somehow as we loosen up, things are getting better, then it's up to the governments to say, look, we need to keep pushing the envelope in better treatment, in advancing a vaccine and telling people how they can adapt to it. I'll tell you where I get stuck on that. I, I wouldn't believe that because we went through this already and it was a position, it was a question of credibility. Uh, the, the administration said, no problem. It's no problem. Don't worry about a thing. And then it was a problem. And then the administration said, well, we're, be, we're behind that. I mean, that's behind us. And now we're going to reopen. But there was no reason to reopen. There was no, no reason no whatever reason to reopen to to the and everyone problem. was confused. Everyone bit that bait. We reopened without fixing the health problem. And I now mean, look, I, I and just, now look what I, happened. I, it's I, not a surprise. This is competence at the state level. Florida has had relatively few uh, nursing home deaths. Florida has at a, in terms of deaths per million, if you pull up world, uh, world Domita, a very good performance. And that's because uh, DeSantis and Maxwell, his head, wouldn't send any infected patients back to the nursing homes. Cuomo sent them all back. So there's a lot of comp competence at the state level. Hawaii, Hawaii, I think, is a very interesting case because you virtually don't have coronavirus in Hawaii. Okay? You have some cases, but the number of deaths you have is probably, you know, close to the number of people that fell off a of rock or something. I don't know. It's like 17 deaths in a But Don't you think we ought to put every effort to the health care problem before we start working on, on opening the economy at risk? I mean, if we could figure out the health care problem, really get it under control. It's not under control. You'll have to agree with me. I um, think there are risks. We've got to get it under control before we go to step two. And that was the mistake here. And the same thing with... Um, you know, all the reopening without really taking care of the healthcare issues. So is it a surprise that in those meatpacking plants and all kinds of other businesses, we have a huge number of um, new infections? We, we need to solve the infection problem. And then, you know, let's go for it. Let's make, okay, let's make a big reopening. By the time we solve this infection problem is a very tough thing. By the time we save it, we're all going to be living in caves because we'll have no money no food and uh everybody will be and and bezos will have all the remaining money it's really not an answer i i, I totally to i totally agree that time is of the <laughs> essence and i and i think we all have to move very quickly on this and you know fortunately as we as a country right. we have not moved quickly on this and we have had disagreements and controversies and blame game if we had been crisp if, for example, Lou, you had been president, or, or for that matter, if you were running the CDC, we wouldn't be having this conversation. 
I, I suspect this one is not uh, is a tough problem for the U.S. We have very we have a public health service which is largely run by the states. I mean, the CDC could have done a better job on their testing early on, but I think it's time to turn people loose a lot more. There are certain provisions we can. Why take. have we solved this? You We're suggested that we're doing better, but have we solved to, it? Have we solved the AIDS problem? No, but we've learned to deal well, with the AIDS. Is no, nowhere near a threat to world civilization that this is. I'm not sure this is not. How she said much. this was the most complex, most threatening epidemic he'd ever seen. Look, the total deaths in 1954, the Asian flu that hit America, in nine, was about 150,000. We only had. 170 million people at the time. So it would be as if we had three, 300 and, you know, 340,000 deaths instead of 100. That would be the equivalent now. We didn't shut the economy down. We didn't shut the economy down for polio. We have never shut the economy down for an infectious disease. We've isolated parts of the country. We've isolated people. We've uh, adapted to it. But we've never done something this unprecedented in, in, in American history. It's, and you know, we need to get better at it. I, I couldn't agree more. The Koreans, the Japanese, and the Singaporeans were much better at it, but they've gone through the bird flu and, and all the, you know, and the, and the, and the previous Ebola and SARS. They, they, they have the experience. I, I believe we'll be better at it next time. But. Well, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And um, you know the only way we can be able to deal with this on a long-term basis is if we develop systems to contain it on, you know, regularly as part of our new normal. Well, we're going to have to do and that. I'm not time. sure that we've done that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, for example, the task force isn't meeting. Fauci is not being consulted. What is the government doing? It's, it's laying it off on the states, and the, the states are having, you know, you know. And so my, my problem is I don't think we're attending to job one before we get to job two. If you could tell me that we really were uh, uh, you know, attending to job one, I would say absolutely right. And we have to move uh, you know, in, in tandem both jobs, but we're not attending to the first thing. But the problem is both outcomes are bad. That's the thing no one understands. The coronavirus is a bad outcome. Not, treat, not being as effective in treating as we might have been or could have been. That's a bad outcome. But also keeping the economies locked down, that's a really bad outcome. Are they locked down now? I, I think in uh, many, no, we're, many- We're opening up in some places. There's still some places that are not. I think we're slowly opening up and that this reflects it in the market. Um, a lot of some states are still highly constrained in what they can do. A lot of small businesses are still struggling. Um, well. What I get is 21 states are having an upsurge in the virus. And those 21 states have all been slack, if you will, um, you know, in terms of uh, distancing and, and precautions. And, well, and furthermore, a lot of those states are actually Republican states where, you know, the, the polls show the Republicans do not care about this as much as the Democrats. Well, of course, the Democrats... Uh... They figure, well, someone will just write them a check. They don't have to worry about it, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. There's, what, what's going on is uh, Newsom and, and New York, and I don't know, maybe Hawaii, they're waiting for a bailout. They're hoping Biden will be elected. He'll just send them a big check, and they can stay home for a whole another year. Oh, I don't <laughs> think that's fair, Lou. <laughs> that's what I think is going on. <laughs> There's not going to be a bailout. We don't have the money for the bailout. No, I don't think there's going to be a bailout. But but we could have we could have governmental action that would be um, you know useful. And so I, I watch the I watch the television and I and I and I see uh, ads from the CDC and the ads are telling me to wash my hands. And I'm right, saying I, I need say so much more than that. The national data on daily new cases shows a continued but slow decline. And uh, the total corona deaths are no longer growing. Uh, they're also declining. Uh, if you look at it since the peak on May 9th, daily deaths in the US continue to decline. So. Well, I, I, come back. Uh, I, 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 I know that in the rural areas of the country where they haven't really cared much about distancing, 
um, it's increasing dramatically. And in those 21 states, it's increasing as we speak. So I'm, I'm not comforted by that, that, that trend that you described. Right, but I would say of the 115,000 deaths, um, 30,000 are New York, 12,000 New Jersey, Illinois, Massachusetts, California, Pennsylvania, Michigan. The rest are pretty low. Connecticut. You're, you're talking about the sum total of all of them from the beginning. Yes. I'm, I'm talking about the resurgence that's happening like this week. As I said, the total number is still shows a decline. If you go to worldometers, the total number of new cases and the total deaths are declining. Maybe not declining as fast as they should, but they are declining. So, so, so tell me what's gonna happen here. In fact, okay, um, I grant you there's a certain amount of resilience in the country. This is the land of entrepreneur entrepreneurship. We have, as you said, we've established ourselves and we certainly still have the cultural strain among us right. to, to build and rebuild an economy, although it's, it's gonna be very challenging in, in the circumstances. What do you think is actually gonna happen here? And how much of it depends on the election? Because that's right in the center. It's been, you know, it's been politicized and, and the election has been intertwined, if you will, with coronavirus and with the reopening. Um, so what's going to happen? I mean, who's going to win the election? I don't think it, I think this issue is beyond the federal level. Okay. All the big fight on the federal level is going to be about money. The states have control now and they're learning what they're going, they're going to make the choices and their own populations are going to decide that. And so, so I don't really think the feds, the feds are going to be about money and research. We'll continue to put a lot of money into research. But I mean, this is something we ought to come back to from time to time and, um, you know, see. Well, would, would you buy into the market now? Um, I believe that one should have a diversified portfolio and ride these up and down. That's what I do. Make, and you should rebalance as appropriate. I don't think I'm smart enough to know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what Charles Schwab says, too. <laughs> I'm with Charles Schwab. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> you know, we we live in a in a such a strange time. I bought Boeing when it crashed, and it still crashed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's like every day there's a, another another surprise, and every day suggests another direction in another vector. And yeah. um, I I I really can't say that I'm optimistic. On the other hand. Um, you know, I, I think I agree with you in the sense that the country does have some kind of resilience there. Uh, and it has to find that resilience. It has to tap that resilience, encourage that resilience, um, and, and, and pave the way for that resilience, not Absolutely. stand in the way. And what we're seeing, even though there's a lot of dark clouds, we're seeing some resilience emerging now. So I'm going to leave it there till next time. <laughs> Why, why do I feel that everything could change between now and next time? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> thank you, Lou. It's great right, to talk you, to you. Great, great. Believe Lisa. it or not, I have to run to another meeting in China. <laughs> okay, all right, well. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. See you next time.